Hacking in competitive Pokemon is one of the most hot button issues that comes up every time there's a big tournament, like Worlds 2023 this year, which was in Yokohama, Japan. There were a bunch of player DQs because trainers use hacked Pokemon. But why in every competition is there a ton of hacks, despite players getting a warning email about how strict the hack checks will be this year? Well, I think it's because in past Pokemon games, building a team was prohibitively difficult, and sometimes nearly impossible. Many people say this has improved over time, and that Scarlet and Violet is the most accessible it's ever been, and that there's no excuse for hacking anymore. But is this true? To find out, I've collaborated with my friend and fellow YouTuber FreezeEye. I'll be building his team for the 2023 Pokemon World Championship without glitching or hacking to see just how difficult it actually is to make a World Championship caliber team in Scarlet and Violet. Once Freeze Eye sends me the team, I'll get to work setting up a plan. So while I wait on the team, let's go over the ground rules that I have for this challenge. I will not be using any glitches, like the duplication one that was patched out recently. Why? Well, I believe that doing so trivializes the team building process, and that will give too much credit to Game Freak, who makes things needlessly difficult despite knowing their games are to be played in tournaments, and that Pokemon trainers are going to have to train their Pokemon themselves. However, I will allow two different things that verge on the border between glitch and exploit. Date skipping and using a turbo controller. In this game, if you change the date forward one day, it resets all the raids and the items on the ground. There is no punishment in game for this, like getting locked out of raids, and they've had at least four patches to remove this. So I don't really think I count it as a glitch. As for the turbo controller, I'll explain that a bit later, but it's kind of necessary for team building in this game. Oh, lastly, I'll be doing this on a freshly completed copy of Pokemon Violet. I want to see what the full grind is like, from new player to world's competitor. I've beaten the game and the post game, which means I've done the academy tournament and unlocked six star raids. I haven't picked up any specific TMs or items along the way. Okay, Freeze, I just sent me his team over. Let's see what we have. Fluttermane and Iron Hands. Okay, awesome. These are VGC staples this gen. Obama Snow, nice. All these should be easy so far. Who else? Uh, Heatran. Cresselia and Ursaluna, huh? But these Pokemon aren't even in Scarlet and Violet. That's right, for the first time in a long time, the Pokemon company is allowing transfer-only Pokemon. These three are in Scarlet and Violet, but there is no way to obtain them without owning an older Pokemon game. Not only that, you cannot do it with just one game. Uh, allow me to explain. If we take a look at who Freeze needs for his team, they're all available in Pokemon Legends Arceus. So it seems like that's the only extra game we need, right? Nope. Freeze has requested a zero attack Heatran, a zero attack Cresselia, and a zero speed Ursa Luna. Pokemon Legends Arceus has no way to check Pokemon IVs in it. The game has stats, yeah, but they're completely independent from the invisible and hidden away IV system. So the only way to check these Pokemon stats would be to transfer them out of the game. And at that point, the game has been saved, and I cannot reset for the legendaries like Heatran and Cress anymore. Okay, so maybe I could use a different Generation 8 game to get Cresselia and Heatran. They're available in the Dynamax Adventures and Sword and Shield, right? Well, even if you did that, you would still need Pokemon Legends Arceus, since that's the only place you can evolve Ursaring into Ursa Luna. But also, Dynamax Adventures are not ideal. They take about 15 minutes to play through, and the legendaries at the end have four guaranteed perfect IVs making it very difficult and slow to reset for a zero attack here. Okay, so if I won't use Sword and Shield, what about Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl? Well, these games would actually work. You can soft reset for Heatran quite easily here. Cresselia is still a bit annoying though. It's a roamer, so it can take a while for you to encounter in the wild and check its stats. To me, this is just unacceptable. I need to own BDSP and Pokemon Legends Arceus, two what are effectively spin-off games, by the way. These did not have any VGC tournaments, so VGC players probably skipped out on these. And if you need both of them, that's $120. Straight up, $120. But you could be conservative, just buy Pokemon Legends Arceus and accept unoptimal attack IVs. That's only an extra $60, right? Well, to me, that's still unacceptable, but it gets even worse. Let's say your team has an Urshifu on it, one of the best Pokemon in the meta, and it also had an Ursaluna, as Freeze Eye's team almost did. Well, in that case, Urshifu is a $90 Pokemon. You must own Sword or Shield and the $30 DLC. This is blatantly pay to win. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Those with more money and more Pokemon games have an advantage over those who do not. It's like if in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, to use Young Link, you had to own Super Smash Bros. Melee. That's why I decided to say screw it. If we're allowed to use old games, we're gonna use old games. 
Yeah, all right, BDSP might be acceptable to use, but it would take a long time in those games, and I would still have to fix up the heat train in Cresselia with mints and bottle caps and stuff. So I don't really want to use them. I also threw out those games months ago. That's why I decided I'm going to use multiple old games and I'm going to compare them to Scarlet and Violet and to each other to see which one of these is the most effective way to get a Pokemon for the World Championship. I'll be using Soul Silver for Ursa Luna, Black and White 2 for Heatran and Cresselia, and Shield for Obama Snow. Since this is the first team I'm ever sending to Worlds, I also want it to be a bit special. So when able, I'll go for a Shiny, a matching Pokeball, and a Mark or Ribbon. I actually think the old games will have it easier, like Black and White or Soul Silver. With that said, it's time to go for Fluttermane and Iron Hands. I tackled the two Mons in Scarlet and Violet first because they would be the most tedious to do. So I figured let's get the least fun stuff out of the way first. I started with Iron Hands, which specifically needs a 29 IV in speed. I didn't aim for a shiny Iron Hands because it's kind of a tedious shiny hunt, and I only had about a week to put this whole squad together. I didn't have the shiny charm, so my only chance is a 1 in 1024 using the Herba Mystica sandwiches. As for the technique for hunting for the speed stat, I used the list of sandwich recipes devised by my good friend Papa Hefe to make a level 3 encounter, title, and sparkling power fighting sandwich. This will make only Iron Hands spawn in Area 0, while giving it a boosted shiny and mark chance. I also aimed to catch Iron Hands in a quick ball since it matches its color scheme very well. The optimal technique for catching these mons is to backstrike them with the ZR Pokeball throw, which stuns them for turn 1 of the battle and increases your catch chance on that turn. So Quick Ball has a very high chance to catch. Iron Hands is surprisingly able to turn around really fast, so you gotta do the sneak mode by pressing B to get behind a Pokemon. It was a little bit tricky at first, and after my first sandwich buff had run out, I still didn't have the speed IV I was looking for. So I reset the game to conserve my Herba Mystica and I tried again. And after a total of 51 minutes of catching and checking IVs, I caught an Iron Hands with 29 in speed. There's no way to check this in-game, so I used some candies from raids to level it up to 90 to be absolutely certain this stat was correct using a stat calculator. It's very cool that to hit a specific speed tier, I need to use an external tool not affiliated with TPCI or Game Freak to figure out what I got. I get it, external tools like this will always be helpful, and probably better than official ones. But it would be nice if they actually tried. But anyway, welcome Booyah, the 29 speed Iron Hands to the team. Well, onto Flutter Main, and I decided to actually shiny hunt this one, because it's got an easy trick to it. And this is only my second shiny hunt ever, if you don't count RNG manipulation at all. So as for this trick I mentioned, it's that Flutter Main appears to be a night only spawn, but this is not true. It actually spawns in the day, and a strange mechanic removes it instantly upon spawning, if it's daytime. You can see this by holding ZL while running a Ghost Encounter Power 2 or 3 Sandwich, and you'll see tons of Fluttermanes spawning but disappearing, and you can't encounter them. But if a Fluttermane is shiny, it won't be despawned. This is because the removal mechanic has an exception for shinies. So while the Sandwich odds I have are still only a 1 in 1024, if the Fluttermane is constantly respawning, it will produce a shiny much quicker than I would otherwise. So just like Iron Hands, I use Papa Hefe's sandwich recipe to make a level 3 encounter, title, and sparkling power ghost sandwich. Then I sit next to this rock and wait until I see a shiny. I catch the shinies, check if they've got a zero attack, and if they don't, I reset the game. And yes, I delete the shinies if they're not zero attack. I ended up catching over 20 shiny flutter mains I threw in the garbage during this hunt. I didn't want to waste any of my Herba Mysticas, which are the rarest item you need to craft the sandwich. Since this is a relatively fresh save, and I don't have a ton of Herba Mysticas, it's important for me to preserve them as much as I can. This hunt went on for hours, and multiple times I found two or three shiny flutters on screen at the same time. Eventually though, a zero attack shiny flutter popped up on my screen. I caught it in a nest ball, to match, and it even had a mark. Welcome to the team, Kotz the Teary-Eyed. In total, it took me 6 hours and 36 minutes to get this Pokémon. It might seem horribly tedious, but since this hunt is so passive, I really wasn't doing much. I was just checking the screen every 15 minutes or so to see if there were any shinies and to see if my sandwich buff had run out yet. And I know what you're going to say. Blissey, this is disingenuous. Most team building won't go like this because you don't have to go for a shiny. You could have just done a zero attack flutter main. You're right, so I timed that too. Zero attack without the shiny took me about 34 minutes. It was just my own desire to make a pleasing team for the world championships that slowed this down so I'll count the 34 minute one instead. All right, so the first two Pokemon are caught. We will need to fix them up later, but we can ignore that for now and move on to the other four. The next Pokemon I caught was Ursa Luna. 
we will be heading all the way down to Gen 4 for Ursaluna in my copy of Soul Silver. If you're familiar at all with Gen 4, you may be surprised when I said that I think it's going to be easy to get competitive shiny Pokemon here. Because before Gen 6, it was notoriously inaccessible. Well, that's because I'll be using a technique known as RNG manipulation. And not just in Gen 4 either. I'll be using this to some degree for every remaining Pokemon on the team. So let's go over a brief explanation of how RNG manipulation works in general, and then I can cover the specifics each game has when we get to them. Pokemon games try their best to be random, be it wild encounters, Pokemon IVs, or shininess. But computers are not great at this, so they have to fake it in some way. The way all Pokemon games do this is by using specific algorithms, which are often pretty old and open source. The algorithms typically go like this. They take an initial value from somewhere in the game system, usually its state and time, then they convert those values into a hex number to form a starting point, which we call the initial seed, for the RNG. Then, in some pattern, it adds numbers to the initial value over and over whenever something random needs to happen. Like an NPC turning, rain making particle effects, or Chatot's custom cry having its pitch shifted up and down. We get all this info by using predictive tools on a computer. They are simulations of what the game's RNG does, and do not connect to our game console or cartridge in any way. It just tells us what buttons to press, and what the expected outcome is. Alright, with that, let's move on to Manipping the Ursa Luna. Anyway, the Ursa Ring here is going to need 431 IVs and a 0 in its speed stat, with a brave nature to boot. I'll be breeding for it since I think the shiny Ursa Luna matches a Pokeball pretty well. This is actually the cartridge I used to build Ray Rizzo's 2010 team, so if you haven't seen that video, please check it out. In any case, that team required a 4 IV 0 speed ditto for breeding, so I already have that as one of the parents. For the other parent, I just catch a random Ursa Ring near Mount Silver and I begin the breeding process. In Gen 4, we can control the initial seed value by setting the date and time of the DS and launching the game at the right 1 30th of a second window. That forms our initial seed. We'll have to do this twice though, since the egg RNG in this game is a two-step process. First is what's known as the held RNG. This is when the daycare man tells you he has an egg ready, and at that point the Pokemon's nature, ability, gender, and shininess is already determined. So I deposit the two parents and use Pokefinder, which is the RNG simulator I mentioned before, to find a date and time for when a shiny, brave Teddy Ursa will spawn. Then I set my DS to that time and verify I hit the correct seed by repeatedly calling Juggler Irwin, whose three random sayings over the Poke gear can confirm to me where I am in the RNG. Once I'm on the right seed, I save the game and I hatch the egg to verify it's shiny with the correct ability. It is, so I reset. Don't worry, I didn't lose the shiny. Every time I talk to the old man, I'll receive the shiny. This part of the manip is done. Now we have to do the IVs. It's done a similar way as before, where I find the date and time for the IVs I'd like, and then I load the game using Juggler Irwin to verify I hit the seed correctly. After that, I advance the RNG forward with some chatouts who have a custom cry via the move chatter. And when I get to the right RNG state, I pick up the egg, hatch it, and verify the IVs are correct using the judge in the battle frontier. At this point, I decide I want Gorgug, which is what I've named the Teddy Ursa, to have a ribbon from Heart Gold and Soul Silver. I decide on the one that you get from beating Red, which gives the title The Living Legend when you set it into battle, which I think is pretty cool. I make a quick pit stop to the Elite Four and then to Mount Silver for Red, and I've got the ribbon. Now we have to transfer him up via Gen 5 in the Poke Transporter mini game. I waste a bit of time here because the Poke Transporter makes you pick six Pokemon to transfer, but I don't want to transfer six Pokemon. Luckily, if you only catch the one you want in the minigame and let the timer run out, it'll only transfer the one you caught. So I wait the two minutes so I only have to transfer the Teddy. The rest of the transfer process is thankfully pretty easy. Poke Transporter is just a few button presses and now I have to type a code to send him from bank to home. Now I just have to evolve Gorgug, which I can only do in Pokemon Legends Arceus. I don't have the item I need to do so, and the only way to get it is to run around the Crimson Mirelands on the Ursa Luna Mount, checking all of the sniff spots. These are static locations, so I just mark them on my map and do loops until I find it. This takes a while, about 20 minutes, which is insanely annoying. In fact, I even found and failed a full odds shiny Turtwig while looking for a peat block. Whoops. <laughs> Anywho, evolving still isn't done because I've got to wait until there's a full moon. This takes another 5 minutes of spam sleeping at the tent and checking if the peat block can be used on the Ursa Ring. Now Gorgug is all ready to be sent into Violet and be trained. All in all, it took me 3 hours and 21 minutes to RNG, get the ribbon, transfer and evolve Gorgug, which is a long time. But dang if he doesn't look cool. Okay, moving along, I'll be taking the Poke Transporter to Gen 5. As I mentioned, I'll be going for Cresselia and Heatran here. 
simply because I have a white 2 with both of them ready to rumble. Black 2 was my main game when I was playing these games, so my white 2 is devoid of anything. I just beat the story and didn't do much else. I do a little prep by trading over a false swiper from Gen 4, which is my Breloom, and I buy the matching Pokeballs that I'd like. For Cresselia, I go with a Heal Ball, and for Heatran, it's a Repeat Ball, even though I've never caught a Heatran before in this game. So now it's just time to RNG manipulate them. And luckily, Gen 5's RNG works very similar to Gen 4's, except it's even more lenient. In Gen 4, the timing is 1 30th of a second, but in Gen 5, we just have to launch the game with the proper date and time down to the second. So it's really, really easy here. And instead of verifying our seed with a phone call to somebody, we actually use Chatot's chatter pitches. Viewing Chatot's summary screen while it has a recorded chatter both advances the RNG by one and tells me where I'm at based on the recording's pitch. Because I wanted both a perfect and a shiny, I had to do uh, quite a lot of Chatot advances. 623 in fact, but you gotta do what you gotta do. And after 623 uhs and ahs, first try I get the shiny Cresselia to pop up in only 12 and a half minutes. But now we gotta catch this thing in a heel ball. And let me tell you, this was arduous, especially considering my false swiper was Breloom, who is weak to Cresselia, and it has a healing move. So this took quite a while. It was just a matter of patience though, and after 22 minutes total, catch and RNG combined, I had Dana the bold, perfect, shiny Cresselia in a heal ball with zero attack. For Heatran, we just get to do a repeat, like the ball it's in. You see, for Cresselia's target, I used a synchronizer to change the nature to bolt. But if I don't use a synchronizer, the nature is actually modest for this target, which is what Heatran needs. So I use the exact same initial seed on repeat to get Heatran, pretty much with no differences other than the synchronizer. I had to be careful during the catch because Breloom is also very weak to Heatran. But with some patience and potions, I was able to get Sakazuki, the 5 IV, 0 attack, shiny, modest Heatran in around 35 minutes. Unfortunately, Gen 5 has no ribbons I can acquire here. I decide that I'll get the photo ribbon from Pokemon Legends Arceus though, later, after I'm done training and such, because I think it's a cool ribbon to have. I do have one thing to do before the transfer though, which is to get and teach Trick Room to Cresselia in Generation 5. I do this because, in these games, the TMs, which are the items you can use to teach moves to a Pokémon, are not consumable and you can use them infinitely. And while transfer moves are erased if they cannot learn those moves in Scarlet and Violet, if they can learn them, they're in the Move Selection option in Pokémon Home. So teaching Trick Room here saves a Trick Room TM in Violet, where it, the TM is consumable and would get used up, this saves me just a little bit of time. After that, it's just the usual transfer process. All in all, both Pokémon, the TM, and the transfer took just under an hour at 59 minutes and 49 seconds. That's really good, I think, especially considering I won't have to use any money for bottle caps or mints. Well, we just have one more team member to go, so let's head to Galar to get Obama Snow. So Obama Snow is an interesting mon to get. It's not actually that easy for me to get a shiny with zero attack and a modest nature very quickly. In Sinnoh, it's only able to be caught on roots with snow, which I can't use Sweet Scent on. So I'd have to use the tedious Poke Radar Manip. Plus, Dive Balls, which is what I want to catch it in for matching purposes, are actually kind of rare in Diamond and Pearl. It's also not available in Gen 5 at all. And RNG Manips in Gen 6 are insanely tedious and slow. And it's once again not manipable in the wild in Gen 7. So here we are in my copy of Shield. Most people know about Radar RNG. It was very popular for a while via custom firmware bots and hacks and like Twitch giveaways. But you actually don't need any of that to do Radar RNG and Radar RNG is kind of really slow and bland. So I decided to move to the more obscure Overworld RNG Manip, just for fun and interest purposes. In this game, the initial seed is generated by a cryptographically secure chip inside the switch. So we can't just change the date and time to get whatever we want. But after that seed is generated, it's advanced forward using a well-known and reversible RNG algorithm called Zoro Shiro 128. The various things advance this RNG forward, like Pokemon or NPCs blinking, getting on and off your bicycle, closing the menu, random weather, and changing the date one day forward. But the most important one is on a Pokemon summary screen. In these games, when you press in on one of the analog sticks, which is sometimes known as L3 or R3, on the Pokemon summary screen, the Pokemon will do one of two animations, one for what would be its physical attack, and one for what would be its special attack. This is chosen randomly by the Zoro Shiro RNG, and there's no other advancements happening while we're in here. So using these random animations, we can identify both where we are in the RNG and we can use it to move forward to get what Pokemon that we want. So all I have to do now is find a spot in the overworld where there's no chance of rain, no NPCs, no Pokemon, and when I walk close to the grass, Abomasnow will spawn. 
so I can use this to find my seed and RNG manipulate in Obama Snow. The downside is that this process is, uh, slow. The 128 in Zoro Shiro, that stands for how many bits it has, and each analog stick press is one bit. So we need to do it 128 times to find our current seed. So I do that, and I see I've got a shiny Obama Snow at 925,000 advances away with a modest nature and zero attack. The advances here are not quick. The fastest one that I can do is a date skip, and each date skip is about 7,200 advances. Luckily, I can do this somewhat autonomously. You see, I have a very sophisticated turbo controller called the Ghoulie Kit King Kong Pro 2, which lets me record my inputs for 10 minutes and play them back. So I record one date skip, and I can multitask for about a month until I need to manually intervene. Not as good as a very fancy date skip Arduino, but I think it will do. Two hours of date skipping like this later, I'm 6,136 advances away from my target, so I can no longer use the date skip. I've got to do something that's in smaller batches. I just did the simplest, which is on the party screen. You see, every time you press in on the analog stick here, even if a Pokemon's animation doesn't play, the RNG is advanced by one. So I set my turbo to do this for a while until I was about 200 advances away. At this point, I did it all manually, counting while I did so. I do my final advance and I run up to the Obama Snow and there she is. Zero attack, shiny and modest. And when I get into the battle, I forgot to buy the dive balls. Narrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
You see, unless a Pokemon is obtained from a raid or one of the special Terra Overworld encounter, its Terra type is randomly one of its normal typings if it's a multi-type Pokemon. So for this team, for example, Heatran has a Fire Terra type. It could have been a Steel type though, but Freezai needs it to be a Grass type. This makes it immune to all Powder moves, notably Spore and Rage Powder. The only way to change a Pokemon's Terra type is to farm Terra Shards, and you get those by defeating Terra Raid battles. Typically, each raid gives you a bunch of rewards when you defeat it, ranging from Bottle Caps to Urban Mysticas to Feathers and Terra Shards for the type of raid that you defeated. You get like one or two shards per raid. So, yeah, it's pretty slow. But we can speed this up somewhat. We just have to engage with the sandwich mechanic further and use a little bit of date skipping. I also think it's worth noting that while they have done events with Blissey raids in the past that give you a ton of Terra Raid shards when you defeat that raid, if you had started a save file closer to World Championships or you missed that event, you didn't have access to those extra Terra Shards. And I think it's really messed up that they didn't do a Blissey Raid event leading up into the World Championships. And yet during World Championships, they announced events with extra Terra Shards. So the players that were going to compete in Worlds didn't have access to very quick team building like they would have earlier in the season. It just, to me, it just seems like a slap in the face. But what do you think? As for the sandwich mechanics, Papa Hefe comes to the rescue again with an excellent sandwich list and video. He's got a sandwich for each of the Terra types. We're looking to build sandwiches that say level 2 Raid Power X, where X is the type of raid we're going to be defeating. The raid power here means that when we do raids of the specified types, we get two extra rewards from the raid, and we're hoping that will be Terra Shards. Ideally, I wanted to farm all the Terra raids before doing any training, so I'd have most of the Pokemon parts and feathers to complete the training in the end but that didn't quite work out for reasons you'll see shortly. First up was the Terra Water Raid farming. I needed 100 shards of this for both Fluttermane and Cresselia. For water, you actually don't have to make a sandwich. It's the only Raid Power level 2 sold in a store anywhere, so we can use that. Now, just before I buy the Raid Power, I look around the map to see how many Terra Water Raids there are. If there's not at least 5, I go into the Switch's date and time, and I change it to be one day ahead, and I look at the map again. This refreshes all the raids in the game. Once there's five, I buy the sushi platter for the raid power, and I run around to all the raids trying to defeat them as quickly as possible. Once the five raids are defeated, I'm no longer picky, and as long as there's a water raid, I'll go do it, and once they're all done, I skip the date again. I also generally try to avoid the six star raids unless they're really easy, since sometimes they take multiple tries or just too long to defeat. After 30 minutes, which is when the sushi buff runs out, I'm at 25 water terror shards, which is halfway there. I date skip again until there's five raids, buy the sushi, and repeat. It's a pretty boring process since I'm just using my Meowth Scarada and pressing A on Flower Trick. I gave it a metronome, which helps with the higher star raids, so Flower Trick does ramping damage every time, but that's it really. And after one hour and 10 minutes of that, I have 60 water terror shards, which isn't so bad. I repeat this process once more, just doing every water raid that I can hit, and in about 53 more minutes, I have the remaining water terror shards that I need. As you can see, the process is about 50 shards per hour, give or take. It can go a little longer or shorter depending on your routing and luck though. The next thing I did was farm for Ghost Terras, which I also used Miascarada for, but with Night Slash instead of Flower Trick. The most eventful thing that happened here was during the second sandwich buff, I got a six star Terra Ghost Ditto raid. This is one of the few raids I'll do because when Ditto transforms, it copies the stats as they are, meaning if it turns into a low level Pokemon, it'll have like five for its defense. So I catch a Magikarp really quick, make the sausage and lettuce sandwich, head online, and the six star Ditto Raid is taken out in one Thunder Punch. Pretty cool. I opted to catch this one because it should come in handy in the future. Who knows? Usually I'm not catching the raids unless it's a Terra type on a Pokemon that's good because the catch animation is so long and it wastes just a little bit of time. That's how optimal I like to be when doing this stuff. Anyway, farming for the Ghost Terra Shards took quite a while. Somehow around one and a half hours. I think I got really unlucky with drops. My routing seemed fine, but that's okay. We move on because it's all in the past now. At this point, I realize I have to do some training because the other two Terra type shards I need are Grass and Fire, which Meowth Garada cannot handle by itself. So I opt to trade Sakazuki the Heatran up so I can easily defeat the Grass Terra raids. Since Sakazuki already has perfect IVs in a modest nature, I just have to EV train it. It needs 252 HP, 36 defense, 148 special attack, 68 special defense, and four speed. This is part of why I wanted to do some Terra shard farming first. While getting the 252 HP is easy, just 26 HP ups, the rest cannot be obtained exactly with vitamins. 
You see, vitamins give 10 EVs each, and only 10. So if I need 68 special offense, I would have to give it 7 zinc, which wastes 2 EVs. Or I would have to give it 6 zinc, which means I don't get the 8 EVs that I need. But because I farmed raids for 3.5 hours using the raid power 2 sandwiches, I have a ton of feathers. These are raid reward items, you can also find them in the overworld, and they give 1 EV each, so they're a nice way to finish off stats after you're done with the vitamins. So all I had to do was give 26 HP ups to the Heatran, 30 irons, 14 calcium, 6 zinc, and then 6 resist feathers for defense, 8 genius feathers for special attack, 8 clever feathers for special defense, and 4 swift feathers for speed, and Sakazuki was EV trained exactly. I also use a bunch of EXP candies, also farmed from raids, to get Sakazuki to level 100. At this point, the sandwiches for the raids are going to get a bit more complex, and I want to take a moment to just complain about the entirety of the sandwich mechanics. You see, while shopping for the grass power level 2 ingredients, I must have had to go to four different grocery stores across Paldea. Why is it like this? Why are some ingredients only in one store in the whole region? I had to go to Artisan just to buy chili sauce. It's so irritating, it exists like just to waste my time. And you can't find this info easily, you just have to go online and Google it. Why is it that in the game? How do I know that? There's no way for me to know. Between training for Heatran and getting the ingredients for the sandwich, this took me 20 minutes outright. And you might think I'm done, but no. What is up with actually making the sandwiches? The whole mechanic is a buggy, frustrating mess. The sandwiches for the raid powers can be quite unruly. As you can see here, I've got like 10 eggs stacked on top of two egg patties, and the entire time the table is just randomly shaking and clipping into itself, and the ingredients vibrate even if I don't touch them, and then they fall off, and I drop down to raid power one. And it's like, why? Why is it this buggy? I understand part of the challenge is that it should be difficult to assemble the sandwich. It's just part of the fun of the mechanic. But my frustration comes with the fact that the challenge is not that the sandwich is unstable, it's that the game is glitching and shaking and that causes the ingredients to fall off. So I don't know. I wish this whole thing was just worked out a little bit better and they had a little bit more time to actually make sure this worked properly. Okay, all right, that's okay. I'm done ranting, we can move on. So after the sandwich is made, it's relatively smooth sailing, but I just got really bored. It took me two and a half hours total for the whole, you know, all 100 grass terra shards. And I was literally almost falling asleep by the end of it. I was just so bored. Like in reality, the terra raid farming is not that bad. It's not that time consuming. It really, it's not. But it's so uninteractive, my brain is melting. Like at least when I had to EV train in gen four, where it's pretty slow, I had to stay awake so I could count things or I could fail and mess up. But this, this is just the A button simulator for 2.5 hours while I drool in my chair. Ugh, at least I only need to handle one more, which is the Terra Fire Raids. To do this, I'll be training up Gorgug the Ursaluna since it's got a ground Terra type. It needs 228 HP, 188 attack, 12 defense, and 76 special defense. That's just 22 HP ups, 18 proteins, 1 iron, and 7 zincs. And then I use feathers to round it out. Gorgog also has perfect stats and the right nature, so no need for mint or caps. I do have to spend my candies that I got from the grass shards to get to level 100 though. With that, we do our final raid spam. Gorgog is able to handle all of these raids with ease, and after an hour and a half, I've got all the fire terror shards I need. So just for farming the terror raids, it took me 7 hours and 33 minutes total, which, I have to be honest, is like completely unacceptable. That's almost the amount of time it took me to get all the Pokemon, that's an hour shy of that. It should not take you the same amount of time to get a Pokemon as it takes you to get the Terra types for the Pokemon. Why is it arbitrarily doubled like that? You know, when I'm doing this, it doesn't feel so bad. I just sit there for an hour, farm Terra Shards for one Pokemon. It doesn't feel that bad. But when you add it up, it really, it's just not acceptable. Okay, at this point, we're looking at 15 hours and 54 minutes total for everything that we've done combined so far. So uh, to me, this is kind of an unacceptable amount of time. It's not too, too bad uh, when you're really looking at it, but you know, if someone sees this number 15 hours or 16 hours really versus genning, they're just gonna gen a Pokemon, right? Uh, so I don't know. We'll see how long it's gonna be after we finish training them because we still have to EV train four other Pokemon and every Pokemon still needs to make sure that they have the uh, correct moves and they have to have all of their PPs maxed and a few of them have to get bottle capped. So we'll see what it looks like at the end, although I don't anticipate this section taking too much more time. So before everyone uh, gets all of the moves and stuff, 
I took a quick 11 minute detour to make sure Juniper, Dana, and Sakazuki all got the exclusive Legends Arceus ribbon that I talked about earlier. All you gotta do is send a Pokemon to Hisui and click prepare them for a photo. Like I said, I wanted everyone to have a cool ribbon and this was the best and quickest one that I could do for the three of them. Anyway, when I started EV training, I decided to continue with Gorgug since he was already in my party and EV'd already. But he still needs Protect, Facade, Earthquake, Swords Dance, and a Flame Orb. He also needs to have his Terra type changed. None of these are learned by level up, which <laughs> kind of sucks, but I did already have the TMs for Facade and Protect, so I used those ups. I then look at the TM machine to see if I can make any, and it turns out I'm only missing Gibble Scales for the Swords Dance move. This is what I'm talking about though. All the rest of the ingredients for Sword Dance are acquired via raid farming. I've battled like no wild Pokemon in this save, so it really comes in handy and doing the raids that way actually saved me a ton of time. So I just head to Area Zero and take out a Gabite and his family using Let's Go mode. Earthquake was a bit more tedious to get. You have to defeat five trainers in the Asado Desert to get it from the League Rep, which I haven't done yet. So I do that now. It takes like 10 minutes, but I get the TM and we're able to move along. I get the Flame Orb from Lavincia Town, and I fly to Medali to change Ursaluna's Terra type to Ghost. The last thing I do is raise all the PP on Ursaluna's moves to the max. This used to be so tedious, even in Sword and Shield, to get all of these items. But here, nah, you could just buy PP ups. And sometimes you get PP axes from raids, and I think from the Battle Academy tournaments as a reward for winning it. So I have some already, and I just use all four on Ursaluna. Easy peasy. Not counting the EV training, by the way, Ursa Luna took me 17 minutes and 48 seconds. That's just getting the proper moves. That's just uh, going to Medali for the Terra type. And that's because I had to go to Area Zero to farm for the Gibbles, and I had to spend the time in Asado Desert beating the trainers. Um, so this is why it was important for Cresselia that I saved some time and taught at Trick Room in Generation 5. I think it's important to mention that optimization, and this is one of the longer Pokemon to take, I think. I think everything else is going to be pretty easy. It really depends on what moves the Pokemon needs to learn. Uh, next up was Kotz, who I give Terra Blast to via the TMs that I have. I think you get a bunch of them in the story. I have like five for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, after that, I get it to level 84 so it can learn Moonblast. I do this using the EXP candies that I have, and it already knew Dazzling Gleam and Shadow Ball, so that's it for the moves. And then since I'm in Medali already, I change its Terra type to Water. After that, I fly to Mesa Goza for EV training, and it gets 252 HP, 228 defense, 12 special attack, 4 special defense, and 12 speed. A very bulky Flutter Man. I do that using vitamins and feathers. Pretty breezy. I also bought and used the PP ups here as well, so all of the moves had the max number of PP. I gave it a modest mint as well. I didn't have to buy one. I got one from raids or the academy tournament or something like that. Kotz is one of the Pokemon who doesn't have perfect IVs, so I do have to bottle cap it up in Montevideo. Make sure not to change attack, though. The last thing I have to do is buy a choice specs for it and set its mark, which is the teary-eyed. And we're all done. About ten and a half minutes, and this is one of the easier gets, I think. After Kotz, I did Juniper the Obama Snow. Since we're in Mesa Gosa already, I did the Vitamins first, and I trained her up. I bought the Bottle Caps and PP-Ups here as well, since, you know, they're right in the same store as the Vitamins. Then, I taught her the TM for Earth Power, and via Reminder, I taught her the Aurora Veil. She also already knew Blizzard, which is one of her moves. The last move I needed was Grass Knot, which was actually in Mesa Goza, just like on the floor somewhere. Once the moves were set, I used the PP ups and I flew to Montevideo to hyper train her. The last thing I did was change her Terra type in Medali, and I gave her a Citrus Berry to hold. I didn't do anything special to get it, it's just something that you get on the, in the game like lying on the ground or something. So she was pretty easy. She took about 10 minutes as well. Next up was me finishing Sakazuki, who needed the right moves, the right item, and to have its Terra type changed. First, I gave a Substitute and Terra Blast since I already had those TMs. Then, it already knew Heat Wave from level up, so I didn't have to do anything to get that move either. After that, I went to Medali to get Leftovers, which is on the floor there, and while I was there, I changed its Terra type to Grass. The last thing I had to do was farm some stuff for the Protect TM, which I didn't have. I KO'd some Vivian for Scatterbug String, and then a single Lechonk for the hair that I would need. This crafting system is kind of creepy and kind of crappy. I really don't like it. I, I. I understand Pokemon wants a post-game loop where you can go around and do stuff. That's why they've pivoted away from doing the single-player Battle Frontier experience to, like, multiplayer raid experience where you're, like, farming TMs and meeting up in the Poke Portal and going around catching Pokemon together. But I have to say, I do not like it. Most people, I think, do raids solo, and you're just going to go around using Let's Go mode, mashing buttons to get the ingredients that you need. I really wish that TMs were just, like, not uh, consumable again. 
in Sword and Shield, it was a bit better. You got so many TRs from raids, it really wasn't a problem. But here, really, I don't often have a lot of the ingredients for the TMs that I need. It kind of sucks. Okay, once the moves were all set up, I did the PP ups and we can move along. Sakazuki took about 12 minutes, a bit longer than usual, probably because of the ingredients I needed, but not so bad. After Sakazuki was Dana. She actually already had three of the four moves I needed already, and I just leveled her up to 72 to get Lunar Blessing, which is Cresselia's new signature move. Then I changed her Terra type to Water, and flew to Mesa Goza to train her and buy some items. I got her Rocky Helmet there, and trained her to the max with Vitamins, Feathers, and PP Ups. She took about 10 minutes, really, really easy. Booyah, my Iron Hands, was the final member up, and it took the longest for a few silly reasons. First up was the moves, and it learns Fake Out, Wild Charge, and Heavy Slam all by level up. And it could already learn them all, which is great. I didn't even have to, you know, give it more levels. But the last move was Drain Punch. I spent about seven minutes looking for Krogunk because I needed Krogunk Slime or whatever to craft the TM. But after the seven minutes, I was like, wait, do I have this TM? And I did, so I wasted a bunch of time there. <laughs> uh, whoops. Well, once that was done, I trained it up with vitamins and I spam PP ups as necessary. I also had to change its nature with a mint to adamant. And after a quick stop to Medali to change its grass terra type, I went to Montevideo to patch up its IVs with bottle caps. I already had an assault vest, so we're about done here. It took 15 minutes to train, but I decided to spend another 15 minutes doing the academy tournament so I could have a ribbon for Booyah like everyone else. Doing the tournament gives it the Paldea champion ribbon. So Booyah in total took about 31 minutes. Uh, you could cut 15 of those out if you don't want to count the ribbon, but I'm keeping it. So Booyah took the longest by far even if you uh, don't count uh, the ribbon thing. And with that, the team is done. So all in all, training took me one hour and 42 minutes, which is not that bad, but it's really not great. Um, you know, this is everything though. You know, typically in older games, EV training would take an hour or two or something like that. But getting the PP ups and PP maxes would take hours and like multiple games. Uh, same with the bottle caps and everything. Just being able to buy things here makes everything nice. Really, the only thing in Scarlet and Violet I think they took a big, big step back on was the TMs. To me, this is such a huge blunder. I really wish they weren't consumable. I really wish I didn't have to go and KO Pokemon to get all the ingredients. It's really frustrating and such a huge step back. It's honestly the only reason anything took longer than 10 minutes. That's like actually the truth. Everything that took longer than 10 minutes involved me needing to go out and get a TM. So I'm, I'm really not happy with that. But what's the total time here? In total, everything took 17 hours and 36 minutes if you don't count the shiny hunt for cots. If you count the shiny hunt, that's another six hours on top of that. Uh, so that would be like 24 hours, uh, which is still really not that bad. Um, but it's only not bad if this is what you like doing. The big disconnect people have is that being skilled at battling being skilled at taking six Pokemon and using them effectively in battle, uh, no matter what format you're playing, is not a skill that you hone by playing in-game and building your team. They are two separate things that you have to spend time on and get good at. And quite frankly, the time isn't even the biggest advantage. The real advantage here is the cost. At minimum, you're going to need $120. 60 for a Turbo Controller and 60 for Pokemon Legends Arceus. And if you want Urshifu, one of the best Pokemon in the metagame, that's another $90, okay? You cannot discount the cost of the DLC. It's always 30 bucks. So, and Sword and Shield are not going for that much cheaper than 60. They're going for like 50 secondhand. They're not old games, so they're, they're, their value is not low. So to me, if you are a newer player or you don't keep your old games, or even if you're a VGC player and you didn't buy Legends Arceus or BDSP because there wasn't an official circuit, you were at a disadvantage because you had less money and less things. And I think the amount of material things you have in the real world should not be impacting how well you're capable of competing in an official tournament circuit. Like, I'm lucky I had a white two that I didn't have to replay. It, to me, this is just ridiculous. I've been playing Pokemon my whole life. I never threw out any games. My parents never threw out any games. I got very lucky with that. Not everyone is gonna have that same experience. Not everyone plays Pokemon for the same reason. If you are criticizing people for being 30 and playing Pokemon and not having all of the games, get real, man. Not everyone has the same life experience as you. So to me, this is just unacceptable. They need to do something about this. They need to make sure all the Pokemon that are available 
to use in the BGC circuit are available in game. They should also put a better money farming uh, method into the game. And honestly, they shouldn't have any of this. I would prefer if there was a showdown editor in the game or competitive Pokemon had its own game, like Pokemon Stadium 3, where you can make teams without having to worry about anything. And that's what the competitive circuit is played on. And then Game Freak can continue to pump out bangers like Legends Arceus without worrying about the competitive circuit at all. But it really feels like a pipe dream to me. <sighs> With that rant out of the way, was my hunch about some of the older games being faster correct at all? Or was Scarlet and Violet the ruler here? Well, the fastest Pokemon was Cresselia in Black 2, clocking in at a total of 30 minutes for catching, trading, and EB training. Iron Hands, if you subtract the 15 minutes for the ribbon, was the next fastest at 45 minutes. If it is faster for me to purchase Black 2 and get a Cresselia in that game, I think there is a problem here. And if you don't, I don't know if we can agree about anything. I'm just done with this. I like making teams. I like uh, building competitive teams but I'm just over Game Freak consistently not caring about the players or the integrity of their game. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm sorry to end on a downer like this. I'll catch you next time. Please make sure to like and comment if you enjoyed it. Later.